Good morning, and I greet you all from Armenian Brotherhood Bible Church in Pasadena. And we are in the second Sunday of, of New Year. And um, unfortunately, we still have to do this online, but we join our hearts together and we lift up our songs of praise and prayers to the Lord Almighty in order to teach us from his scriptures and lead us into his pathways. Before we go into the worship, let us join in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this opportunity even to meet online and virtually join together in your presence and uh, go deep into your scripture and listen the words that are uttered to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. May your guidance be with us as we navigate through all the tough times ahead of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hello everyone, it is good and pleasant to get together in unity. Well, we're not together, but we're in unity. <laughs> and even though coronavirus has brought division, but Christ brings unity. And we praise him no matter what. Uh, this first song, I think, is a good song for this time. I have a hope. Let's start, Hovig. darkness and he turns it into light 
That's what I believe is happening in this transition time. I believe this is a transition time for church. And I believe we come to ourselves. I, we all study ourselves in this time because we have a lot of free time and no church services. And I believe this is a time where true Christians will know that they are true Christians and they will cling to God even more. And those who are just coming to church to play the church game, <laughs> there's no game to play and they will be out. So I believe God has something to say to us in this time. And I have been much, much closer to my Savior in this time because of this free time that we have. So um, praise the Lord. We, we thank Him in, in all circumstances, not for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. But mainly because He came and he lived and he died for us and he gave us life that's why we praise him him because he gave his everything uh, <clears throat> this God is mighty to save and he's our God he's my God he's a personal God so once again I want to encourage you to uh, be passionate about who he is not only what he has done but for who he is he is good he is so good the more I get to know him after 43 years, <laughs> I realize that he is so good and I fall in love with him every single day. Well, especially in these times that we have, maybe we have much more time. What a good opportunity to take that opportunity to get to know him more through his word, through messages that we hear, through songs that we sing to him and we worship. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave well a couple of weeks ago we celebrated Easter at our homes but that's uh, our victory because he conquered the grave we will too everyone needs compassion love that's never failing let mercy fall on me 
everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, and the hope of to hear the word of the Lord. Today's lesson comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 33, and I will be reading from verses 12 through 17. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. I often heard stories about families' immigration to new countries, where some of them were forced to have one of their parents, mostly fathers, to move to the new country first, get a job, rent a place, start a uh, livelihood, and then call for the rest of the family to join. Though this is a separation, and it might go for months 
or even years, and it could certainly cause pain, yet the family can look to the positive side of it. They can have a sense of security, of having someone they trust, they love, being in the strange land they are about to step in, and knowing that the person made all the necessary arrangements, preparations, so that they can enjoy a smooth social or cultural transition. Imagine the sense of assurance of knowing someone closes there ahead of you in a strange land and telling you everything is fine, you can come. Sometimes I imagine if we could apply the same concept for the new year, considering it also a kind of a strange land, a land that we haven't been there before, a territory of time and place we haven't experienced it before. I mean, no one has ever been into that territory before that we are calling it 2022. No one knows what the days or the times are holding for us. And we wish, just like the immigration stories, we wish if someone had been there, secured the place, and called us to come with the assurance that everything will be okay. From human perspective, I know this doesn't work. Yet from the spiritual perspective of our faith in the promises of God and in his providential character, we can say that it can be true. As human beings, we are confined into the limitations of time and place. We cannot go before time. We cannot halt the times that we are living in, the present. And we can neither go back in time. But our creator God, he is not limited in time. There is no sense of time in God. He is from the beginning and he is also the end. Everything in him, time and place, is the same. And that's why we know that God has always been with us and already holds the future for us. Therefore, we can truly agree with the famous quotation that says, I do not know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And here we come to the story that we have just read from the scripture. Centuries ago, Moses and the people of God were experiencing such insecurity and confusion as they, as they had been just liberated from captivity in Egypt and were preparing to cross into the promised land, promised by God. These people spent almost 430 years in captivity. There were like 11 generations after Jacob's move to Egypt during Joseph's influential time. And just recently, they have been liberated and witnessed God's liberating arm as they crossed the Red Sea and they saw the pillars of cloud and fire guiding them across the Sinai Desert. This was their recent experience. Their journey lasted for around 40 years, during which God made a covenant with them. God created, formulated a spiritual identity, a new spiritual identity in these people. And at some point, God also disciplined them and held them accountable for all their sins and disloyalty towards his commandments. One of those sins, and maybe the major one, was building, crafting, and worshiping a golden calf, that is in Exodus chapter 32, upon the demand of the people. While it took a long time for Moses to come back from the mountain as he went up in order to receive God's commandments. So the people were restless, they were impatient, and they didn't know where this guy is or when he will come back. Let us make an idol for ourselves. So that was the major sin. And God was so angry. It was so painful for God to see how these people were acting. 
and surely there were some consequences. So what goes in the conversation between Moses and God after this disloyalty is the core message for today's sermon. In Exodus chapter 30, verse 5, God asked Moses to tell his people, and here we read, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I should go with you for a single moment, I would destroy you. God is good and kind, yet he is righteous and just. His goodness and righteousness go hand in hand together. Those words reminds us of the description that the British novelist and theologian C.S. Lewis gives about God in his fictional novel, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, as he speaks about Lion Aslan. If you have read or seen the movie, you will remember. This is the quotation from the book. Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I would have thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course, he isn't safe, but he is good. He is the king, I tell you. So when, as human beings, we sin against God, we cannot just say that God is good. Yes, God is good and righteous, but he also just, he doesn't accept the sins that we do. Who says anything about safe? Yes. He is good and he is king. God's holiness and his mercy are inseparable. And because of his mercy, because of his mercy, God tells the Israelites that I will not go before you, lest my holiness consumes you. Because you have sinned and worshiped another God made by your hands and jewelry. Then Lord, then the Lord says to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of the land of Egypt, and go to the land I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. And here comes the verdict. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, Hevites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people, otherwise I might destroy you on the way. This is from chapter 33, verses 2 and 3. God promised, and God is fulfilling his promise, but he is not going to lead the people, lest his holiness consumes them. Imagine, from human perspective, I guess this should have sounded great to the people. Since many would like to practice a religion where we get all the good things, as promised land in case of the Israelites, and do nothing in return, be not accountable for anything. Here the Israelites were going to inherit a land as promised, but God was not going to lead them. Only an angel of the Lord was going to. And here we see Moses' inter Moses' intervention on behalf of the people. Through his intercessory intervention, he asked the Lord for mercy and for his companionship. Listen to what he says to God. If your presence does not go with us, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how can we be known that you, we are your people and I have found favor in your sight unless you go with us? This is an intercessory mediation, intervention on behalf of the people. So when it comes to Moses, God says, I will be with you. My presence will go with you. God addresses in the second person singular in Hebrew, but not in plural. So it means God's presence will go with Moses. But when it comes to the people, God says, I will send an angel to lead them. God says, I will send an angel 
Moses says, Lord, it's not the same. We beseech you. We need your presence. Otherwise, do not lead us up from here. I like what Moses does here. I like what character he shows here. He shows a characteristic of a true leader who grew in faith and the spiritual maturity as he intercedes on behalf of the people. In other words, Moses is praying and asking God, it would mean nothing if people went up ahead and inherited the land without having God as their true leader. It would mean nothing if we possess everything, if we have a land and become a nation, if we prosper physically, economically, politically, but we do not wake up every morning and experience God's presence among us as individuals, families, or even a nation. It doesn't mean anything. I remember what Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul, loses the companionship of God, loses God's presence in his soul and with his soul? Moses was not bargaining with God. He was asking for mercy and bits of patience with his people. In his times and days, Moses was taking the role of the same person God has always sought for his plans. As we read about this person in Ezekiel chapter 22. I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land, so I would not have to destroy it, but I have found no one. Moses was taking the same role. Even Psalm 106 give us further interpretation on the role that Moses took upon himself, where it says, so he, God, said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to keep his wrath, from destroying them. It is interesting to notice the spiritual maturity Moses was demonstrating and how he became a leader compared to the earlier version of him when he was called to this same leadership position and encountered God in the burning and unconsumed bush in Exodus chapter 3. When God called Moses to send him to the Pharaoh. We see Moses throwing out all the excuses that he was not qualified for the job. Can you imagine? When we apply for a position for a job, we throw out everything positive so that the boss or the recruiting team will know that we are qualified. And we call this a positive resume, but here, Moses is giving a negative resume, if you want to call it, that why I'm the worst person on this earth to get this position. Remember, Moses excuses included self-doubt. He said, who am I? Or what would I tell people about your name? Maybe they have forgotten your name. Four centuries passed, and people will ask me, who is this God that you're talking about? What will I tell them? They will not believe me. They will think that I'm crazy. Or, you know, I'm linguistically challenged. I'm not fluent. In Armenian, we will say, Lezus pernismet chitarnar. With all those negative qualifications, we see now another version of Moses, like a 2.0 version of him showing compassion to his people and advocating for them. And here comes God's answer to Moses. The, so the Lord said to Moses, I will do this very thing you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. In chapter 33, verse 17. As we have mentioned, God in Exodus chapter 13 was leading the people in the desert pathways with two pillars. Pillar of cloud and pillar of fire in the day and in the night. The pillar of cloud was also a symbol of God's presence. Every time it came and descended on the meeting tent where Moses went in and had conversation 
uh, with God as two friends would do, it was also an indication or a call to march or camp and gave them direction in their journey towards the promised land. And here in Exodus chapter 40, the same pillar of cloud walked with them. Anytime the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and there was a fire in it by night in the sight of all house of Israel. So it was walking with them. So far, this is the historical event and the spiritual lesson that we can get from the Old Testament and what went on on that famous chapter after Exodus 32 and the sin of the people. God was not leading, but with the intercession of Moses, God decides to go with the people. Where does this take us to? To our present years ahead of us, to 2022. In a sense, every time we celebrate a new year, we also stand in front of 365 days which are full of uncertainties and full of with what ifs and what's the next phrases or thoughts among us. Maybe some of us have already achieved many goals in our lives so far, as far as our education, career, family, job, reputation, and we still long for the next. When I look into our culture, present culture, I see that people are so driven with the so-called concept, what is the next? We ask, what's my next investment? What's my next car? What's my next property? Where is my next vacation? And so on. Being ambitious is something, but feeling insufficient is another thing. On the other hand, when I look into our current situation, we see that there are also people among us who are preoccupied with the same so-called what ifs or what is next, but in a negative sense. When people are driven by their fears, feelings of uncertainties of the next failure, the next calamity in their life, the next variant of the virus, they forget to live the present and they get preoccupied with what might happen or what's the next worst thing that might happen. Part of these uncertainties are about our economy, about inflation figures, about political polarization, about more fluid standards in determining the right from the wrong in our society. And of course, with this pandemic and its variants that might change our lives and already change and give us some difficulty as we try to come back to normalcy. It is interesting to see how the two of the three COVID variant names are from the Greek alphabet, the Delta and Omicron. And just for you to know that there are still 22 other letters in the Greek alphabet. And if we are driven by fear, we ask, what is next? But thank to God, the two most important letters of the alphabet are already assigned to our almighty God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, which surrounds us from the beginning and the end, which give us the assurance that God is the beginning and God is the end, and we are in his realm and in his times. And that gives us the assurance that despite our uncertainties, God has always been with us and will always be. So when we look into the year 2022, and if we wish that someone had been there and could assure us that no matter what happens, the presence of the Alpha and the Omega will be with us, no matter how the land and the paths look strange, yet we know that the Lord will provide his pillars to guide us. We know that Christ has been there. And as long as we keep looking for those pillars in his word, in his scripture, in the inspiration and the assurance that comes from the Holy Spirit, we can navigate through those strange days and times. Thus, let us approach the throne of the Father and pray just like Moses.
with the courage of Moses and beseech him and say, Lord, if your presence will not go with us, do not lead us up from here. In order to hear the same assurance from God that my presence will go with you. My presence that was manifest in Christ will be the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Christ will be our pillar to guide us through the strange paths ahead of us. That's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank from the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. So, what does happen when God's presence go with us? Just like the days of Moses and Joshua, where God's presence led them to occupy the cities and bring down the strongholds, the walls demolished, the same source of God's power will walk with us to demolish now spiritual powers, principalities, and every negative thought that is against the will of the Father. That's what St. Paul wrote in his second letter to the church in Corinth and encouraged the believers to be armed with God's power. Our fathers were all under the cloud and passed through the sea, and Christ was the rock because he was the pillar. When God's presence goes with us, we'll have his energy that keeps us going through tough roads in life, against the dead ends of life, and despite all uncertainties of life. In one of the darkest times of God's people, God sent his messenger to prophet Isaiah and gave assurance to his people that he will renew their power. And that's what we read in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 29 through 31. He gives power to the faint and increases the strength of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. We are next to the source of power to be renewed. A couple of days ago, when Pasadena was having uh, the New Year's Rose Parade, people might have recalled one of the oldest stories that took place or incidents in those um, par par parades, then they saw this um, float suddenly stopped. It wasn't moving because it ran out of gas. So the whole parade was held up until someone got a can of gas. And the amusing thing was that the float itself represented the Standard Oil Company. Even that company could run out of gas, but those who wait upon the Lord, their strength will be renewed. So, believing in the promises of God is not generating a mental power or wishful thinking for better days. It is living by the assurance of knowing who God is and how faithful that God is. So we're not wishing things. We hope because we know our God. So it is the difference between these two boys who go to the soccer practice, and after the practice, one of them is asked, do you have a ride? And the boy says, no, I don't have, but I hope that I will find a ride. I am hopeful that someone will give me a ride. So he is hopeful. He is optimistic. But still, it's a wishful thinking. But whereas the other guy, when you ask him, do you have a right? He, uh, he tells that, yes, my father promised me to pick me up. And no matter what happens, rain, rain or shine, whatever might happen, my father will show up or he will send someone to pick me up because I know my father gave me the promise. So this is the two difference, the difference between the two. Our trust in the promises is not a wishful thinking. It generates from our knowledge of who God is and how faithful he is. And that's how 
we can look into the year 2022. That's the kind of attitude we need to develop as we step into the first days of 2022 and know that our God is already there before us and is calling us to step in with confidence because he has promised that his presence will go with us. And that's the good news from the word of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your promises. We thank you that your presence will go with us and give us this courage to trust all your power into our lives, to trust your person into our days. And may we grow meanwhile spiritually and show the best version of us throughout this coming year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.